Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, in today's middle game video, I'm going to talk about a subject which bothers me uh, very much and which uh, I have to improve uh, in my own play and uh, in my last uh, game, you can find it in the Road to GM series. I failed to do so and that's why I lost the game. I had an opportunity to counter-attack and to defend my position actively, which I did up to a point. And when it was my time to strike, I missed my opportunity and ended up losing. So the topic of this video is going to be active defense and counter-attacking. So what to do when you are seemingly in a worse position and when your opponent is attacking and how to uh, think about positions like these, how to react uh, and how not to be scared. I'm going to talk about three different uh, types of defense and three different situations you you can be in. I'm going to use a game example for each one. The first example is going to be counter-attacking and uh, especially uh, how to counter-attack where your opponent isn't attacking. The, one of the main middle game principles is that when your opponent attacks on the flank, you should strike in, in the center. When your opponent is attacking in the center, you should strike in the flank. So the first game, uh, Tal Spassky, their final, uh, final game from the candidates final in 65 is going to be used for that. Uh, the second game between Kasparov and Petrosian is going to be about active defense and bringing more and more defenders into, into the defense. And that's probably the best way to nullify an attack and to stop your opponent from mating you. So uh, what Petrosian managed to do is very instructive. And the third game is going to be a, Anand Petachnik from uh, the Beal Interzonal in 1993. And this game I'm going to use as an example of a scary attack, which doesn't really do anything, which is what happens very often. Very often your opponents are going to have a scary looking position, a scary piece constellation aiming towards your king, but it's not really that dangerous. And that's the, the difference between humans and engines. Engines can simply calculate and uh, defend perfectly without any emotions and humans get scared. So I'm going to talk about that. So the first game example uh, is Tal Spassky. In this position, Mikhail Tal uh, has the perfect Roy Lopez Knight. Obviously, the knight is on f5, uh, looking at many critical squares, such as g7, uh, h6, e7, and d6. This is the best position for the knight in the royal Lopez, and the knight came via uh, d2, f1, g3, and then to f5. So Tal is preparing a kingside attack, and that much is clear. He has the option of playing his other knight to h4, sacrificing his knight on h6, and then marching his other knight into f5. The bishop is great. Uh, the bishop on b3 is spinning the f7 pawn. The queen is ready to come into the game. So his attacking position is basically perfect. And Boris Spassky uh, is defending. It's a thematic Breyer, uh, closed Roy Lopez position in which his knight was routed from b8 to d7. And now, uh, in this position, if he plays passively, if he tries to do something passive to defend, such as g6, which is a bad move, uh, because h6 is hanging, or just tries to defend passively, then he's going to lose, because firstly, Mikhail Tal is Mikhail Tal. Secondly, all of his pieces are perfectly placed. So in this position, Boris Paski uh, struck in the center and started his counterattack. So in this position, if you are familiar with the Royal Lopez, then the move d5 seems obvious to you. If you're not familiar with the Royal Lopez for black, then you should find an opportunity to strike where your opponent isn't attacking. So the only way to create a counterattack would be in the center or on the queen side. The best way to strike is in the center when your opponent is attacking on the flank. You obviously don't want to start a counterattack on the king side because it's really scary to move your pawns and your pieces uh, from the defense. So d5 is a perfectly sensible move. d5 striking at the center. In this position, Mikhail Tal simply ignored the counterattack or the makings of a counterattack, and he played knight from uh, from f3 to h4. Okay, uh, so what do you do now? Uh, more pieces are mounting up around your king, and the attack seems to be brewing. So he simply continues his counterattack. C5. Now this move is threatening to not trap the bishop, but blunt it, and this move is threatening to create opportunities of his own in the center. Uh, Mihail Tal simply continued with rook to e3, another perfectly sensible attacking move, bringing the rook to g3. And once the rook does get to g3, then the attack is going to look scary, because you're threatening uh, bishop h6, you're threatening knight h6, and then knight f7 if the pawn moves, if the pawn moves, and it seems to be really scary. But Spassky cold-bloodedly 
simply continues his counterattack c4. Uh, I wonder if you can guess the evaluation of this position. It's really during my own games I try to think. Uh, am I worse? Am I better? Do I have time for the defense? Do I have time for my counterattack? And in my last game, uh, if you've seen it, uh, I had the move h5, which opened up the king side for my own attack, and I figured that I didn't have time for that. That's why I didn't play it, and that, that was the best move. In this position, Boris Paski could have thought the same. Do I have time for c4? Probably not. And then if he hadn't played c4, his position would have been worse. But if I turn on the engine now, this position is actually winning for black if two grandmasters are playing. This is more than minus one. Okay, uh, Tal simply continued his attack. Uh, rook to g3. It's too scary to take the bishop because you're going to get checkmated. It's as simple as that. Uh, after knight takes h6, king anywhere, knight takes here, and you're in a world of pain. So he played king to h7, the best, uh, the best defensive move. And now this is prophylaxis, prophylaxis against... Uh, white threats and he can now simply continue his attack. Uh, one very important thing in active defense is to stay calm and don't overestimate your, your opponent's threats. Obviously, you shouldn't underestimate them either. But more often, at least in my games, I find that overestimation of my opponent's threats costs me more positions, more good moves and more games than underestimating the attack. So after king to h7, uh, Tile now has to save the bishop because he has no more threats. Bishop to c2. And Spassky now simply continues. d4. Now this pawn formation seems really scary. And it seems that white's attack, even though all of the pieces are aiming at the black king, isn't really doing that much. Queen to f3 was played, bringing another attack attacker into play. Now the only two pieces which aren't uh, in the attack are the a1 rook and the c2 bishop. Rook a6 was played, defending laterally and probably starting a counterattack on the king side as well, if need be. Knight takes h6, uh, typical tile sacrifice. It's a peace sacrifice, but it actually uh, makes sense and it's one of the best moves in the position. There is nothing better but to take. G takes h6 and now knight to f5, double attacking the h6 pawn. Queen to a8 was played. Uh, threatening uh, this pawn if the bishop moves. Knight takes h6. Bishop takes h6, queen to f5 check, threatening simply to retake the piece, king h8, and now bishop takes h6, giving, uh, uh, getting back the piece. Now the material situation is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 pawns for white, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pawns for black, but black is up a piece. Black has two knights for a bishop, which means that in any endgame black is winning. If black manages to trade off the pieces, he is winning. If the attack on the king side isn't deadly enough, Spassky is winning. And Spassky being a great player uh, that he is, he simply played rook to g8, trying to trade off the attackers. This is one very good strategy if you are material up and if you are defending a position. And obviously you are facing Mikhail Tile, so active defense is very important. If you, if you give him enough opportunity, it's completely irrelevant uh, that he is a piece down. So rook to g8, uh, obviously if Tile trades, then he has nothing. So bishop g5, declining the trade. Queen to e8, bringing the queen into the defense f4, knight to h7, attacking the bishop, bishop to h4, and now the trade is forced, rook g3, bishop g3, rook to f6, bringing his last defender in. Now the only piece that isn't defending is the bishop, and at the same time black is still a piece up, black has his central pawn formation, which is very formidable, and black is simply winning the game. Uh, the game ended in a couple of moves. I would just like to come back to this position. So a typical attacking uh, position in the Roy Lopez, and this could serve as a great lesson uh, for players who, who face the Roy Lopez with the black pieces. The knight on f5 is a scary piece, and it's the best position for the knight in the Roy Lopez. It does support a lot of attacking position positions. If you find yourself in a situation like this, passive defense will lead to a defeat. Uh, Retreating will lead to a defeat. Trying to remove White's attackers is uh, very often too slow. So the best way is to counterattack, especially in the Royal Lopez, in the closed center positions, d5 is your break. So this example, I think, was very instructive because Spassky calculated correctly that Tile doesn't have a deadly attack and then uh, counterattack, counter counterattacked perfectly. So d5, another attacker into play, c5. Rook to e3, another attacker into play, c4. Uh, Tile is mounting pressure on the king side, bringing two pieces into play, and during that time, uh, Spassky played d5, 
c5 and c4 moves which might seem stupid if you if you don't understand the position but he he knew that a counterattack was much more important okay uh, let's go to example two uh, this game is uh, kasparov petrosian and in this position after queen to g4 by kasparov uh, which wasn't such a good move, but it's an attacking move, and this move is basically preventing kingside castles. If Petrosian castles kingside, then he's he's just going to be crushed, because white has too many pawns and too many pieces uh, looking at the kingside. So he decided to castle queenside, which isn't really safe, because the c-file is open, and because white can now march his pawns at his own leisure towards the king. This position is objectively better for white. White has a safer king, White has the bishop pair and uh, the material is equal. These knights on b6 and d7 aren't really that active, but the, impor the importance of the pieces is what I would like to emphasize. This game is a perfect example of how you can try to defend with bringing as many defenders, I'm sorry, towards your king. So if you are defending a position and there is no possibility for a counterattack, the best way to defend is to try to create a fortress with your pieces and your pawns around your king and an opportunity might arise. Now in this example as well, uh, the same as in the last one, the attacker is a magician. Firstly, it was Mikhail Tal, now it's uh, Gary Kasparov, so both players are attacking geniuses, so it even psychologically makes it harder to defend, to defend against them. And Gary Kasparov now started his attack. I mean, why wait? He castled, he gave away where his king is going to be, rook to b1, starting the attack. Uh, king to b8, the first prophylactic move, uh, even though it's not such a good move. b4, starting the attack. Knight to d5, trying to exchange some pieces. If you are under attack, then the best idea would be to trade off the attacking pieces, and the c3 knight is definitely an attacker. Uh, and if you are attacking, then you definitely don't want to exchange your attacking pieces, so knight to f4. Uh, in this position, Petrosian played f5, which, uh, well, sort of tries to prevent any kingside activity and tries to gain some space on the kingside. It's not really relevant for the story here, so I'm going to skip that move. Queen to g3. Knight takes b4, winning a pawn, but, well, uh, Petrosian being the great defender that he is, uh, I really don't un understand how he could have taken this pawn. I I would never take that pawn. I mean, it's just too scary. After knight b4, you're opening up the b-file, and even though you're winning a pawn, there's always a3 removing the knight, rerouting the bishop uh, to this diagonal, threatening a6 and, and stuff like that. But he took the pawn. He figured that he can survive. Bishop d2. Attacking the knight, knight goes back to d5. Rook f to c1. Uh, this is the only piece that isn't playing for now. It can exchange itself for the knight, but Gary Kasparov obviously doesn't want to do that. The plan is bishop f1. After bishop f1, all of the pieces will be in play. King a7, trying to defend. Queen to e1, bringing the queen into play. Now, if you were facing Gary Kasparov uh, in a position like this, I, I think... There are a few people in the world who wouldn't be scared, and they're probably psychopaths. Bishop a3, attacking the rook. Uh, rook to c2. Queen to d6, trying to defend. And now he's rerouting all of his pieces to be perfectly positioned in the defense. And it's really hard to break this position open, even though Gary Kasparov has the open b-file, has the perfect rook on c2, has the bishop and the queen in this battery, and he is about to reroute his bishop on f1 or exchange on d5. It's really hard to break through because, as you can see, all of black's pieces are serving as defenders. And Petrosian was a master defender not because he was, I don't know, such a genius that he was much better than everybody else, but he simply followed uh, defense principles and he brought enough defenders, he played prophylactic moves, he, he, he played it safely. Rook to b3 was played, attacking the bishop. Queen to e7, uh, queen to e2. Rook to b8, another defender uh, comes to a better square, queen to d3. Uh, bishop to d6, now the bishop was attacked twice. Knight to b2, rerouting the knight uh, probably to come into c4. N uh, rook h to c8, knight c4. Now look at the black pieces. Uh, white is attacking with all but one of his pieces, and black is defending with every single piece he has. And that's the only reason why he is still alive. Sometimes a counterattack is too scary. This is move 29. If we go back to move 16, 
uh, where Petrosian castled and Gary Kasparov played king b1. In this position, Petrosian figured that there's no counterattack he could have. The only way to survive the position is to bring enough defenders into play. So coming back to move 29 after knight to c4, this is exactly what he did. What he did, and it's really hard to break this position open. Bishop c7 was played, probably not wanting to to exchange his defender because he has a lot of dark squared weaknesses. A4, the pawn is attacking as well, and now. Uh, this position is better for white. Uh, this is more than plus one, but after Petrosian's next move, it's even worse. B5, uh, if I turn on the engine, now it's going to go completely scary, uh, crazy, and this is now plus three. A plus three position in which Kasparov is completely winning. Now, how often does Kasparov uh, fail to convert a plus three position in which he has five attacking pieces? Okay, uh, he continued with a takes b5, c takes b5. Uh, rook to a2, king to b7, bishop to b4, queen to e8, bishop to d6, uh, rook to a8, defending a6, queen to b1. And this looks terminal, in my opinion. <clears throat> king to c6. This move is... Uh, I don't know who would ever play this move. Uh, king c6 uh, obviously attacks the bishop, but it... Uh, leaves the defense of the a6 pawn, so after king c6, uh, rook b to a3, now we have a position in which uh, Gary Kasparov is sacrificing a knight for the attack, so the best move probably, uh, instead of rook b to a3, was simply to exchange the bishops and move the knight afterwards, and perhaps Gary Kasparov's attack would have been strong enough. After rook b to a3, if I turn on the, the, the engine now, this is minus 3. So Gary Kasparov managed to get a position from plus 3 to minus 3 in a matter of 3 moves. Now uh, Petrosian simply takes the piece, bc4. Uh, rook takes a6 check, defending the bishop and checking the king. Rook a6, rook takes a6, bishop to b6. Look at this defensive force. It's often uh, much easier to defend with pawns uh, than with pieces. But pieces in this position manage to defend the king so efficiently that white can do nothing. He has the bishop pair, he has the active rook, he has the queen, but there's nothing he can do. Bishop c5 was played in this position. Queen to d8, another defender perfectly placed. Queen to a1, trying to create some chances, but after knight c5, d c5, king c5. Rook to a4, uh, Gary Kasparov actually resigned with his own move and there's nothing he can do. So let's go back to the original position. After castles, rook b1, king b8, b4. Uh, how many people would take black here? I don't think anybody would. But Petrosian managed to defend because he had the correct strategy. He brought enough defenders because he saw that the files are open, uh, his pawns uh, are weak, his king is weak, so he managed to defend with the pieces. So that's one really important lesson in active defense. Just remember to get enough defenders around your king and you might just survive even against a magician like Gary Kasparov. Okay, uh, the third position is Anand uh, Fatachnik from the Beal Interzonal 1990, 1993. Uh, this position is the Scheveningen or Scheveningen uh, Sicilian, uh, in which Anand has the white pieces. Uh, he castled queenside, uh, the position is slightly better for white. This is uh, this is not theory anymore, but we are almost in theory. And this game I would like to use an as an example of how to remain calm when you're not sure that your opponent's attack is deadly. This is a problem, as I said, which I have very often. I get too scared and I overestimate my opponent's attack. I try uh, to defend passively instead of actively and I basically lose, even though I was better when I got scared. Uh, bishop e7 was played, g5, uh, Nand starts a kingside attack, h5, closing down the files, uh, the position, f5, knight takes e5, knight to f4, a pawn sacrifice for activity, so black has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 pawns, white has 6 pawns, and it seems that Vichy Anand is going to start a vicious attack, but now, Fatachnik starts a counterattack, knight to c4 attacking the queen and the bishop. Queen to e2 has to keep the defense of the bishop. Queen to a5, another attacking piece coming into play, threatening to take a2. King b1, prophylaxis, defending. Knight takes b2. About this move, I'm, I'm not really sure what to say. Um, he knew that he was worse here. If he doesn't create 
attacking chances than Vichy is simply going to take on e6, probably with the knight even, I'm, I'm not sure, but the attack is deadly if black does nothing. So now black starts to counterattack with the sacrifice. Knight takes b2, and Vichy Anand simply ignores that, doesn't take the knight. Taking the knight is uh, too scary, I, I'm not even sure what would happen if he took the knight here, here. I don't think the attack is deadly, but yeah, probably it is. What about this check? Yeah, the thing is that he, he can then play e5 and have a lot of activity. He doesn't get checkmated, but but it's still scary. So in this position, Vichy Anand simply ing ignored that, played f takes e6, and black castled queenside. King takes b2 was played now, and now we have the point of black's attack. Uh, knight to a4 check, king to c1, b3. And I have to say it does look scary. I mean, uh, if I were playing uh, white, I would be scared about black's attack. I mean, the bishop is coming in, the rook can perhaps come into the game and it seems scary. Knight takes b3, bishop a3 check, king to b1. Uh, knight to c3 check, forking king and queen, but the black king is uh, attacked also. So after king to a1, black can't really take the queen. So queen a4, still threatening the white queen, queen to d3, bishop to b4. And this is a sort of position in which I would get really scared and uh, just play bad moves, I think. Uh, this position seems, uh, well, seems very good for black and I really uh, I'm not too good at evaluating positions and I would like to um, improve that uh, segment of my play. But the point of the position is that even though your opponent has uh, plenty of pieces around your king, even though it seems his attack is scary, you should never overestimate his threats and underestimate your own. The best defense is offense. So if you can attack, instead of defending, try to do that. Obviously, do not neglect what your opponent is doing, but don't let that trouble you. Try to be an engine when defending. Even though I, I don't like engines, I think, objectively, psychology should be avoided in defense. And the best defense is not to think about uh, fear and not fear the position. Knight c1 was played in this position, which is... I mean, it's a defensive move with defense a2, uh, you're stopping checkmate. King to b8, bishop to d4, st starting the counterattack. Rook c8, bishop e5 check. King a7, queen e3 check. Rook c5, rook to d3. And now, once white starts getting his defenders into play, uh, black's attack doesn't seem to exist. And once again, if you look at the pieces, queen, bishop, knight, rook, bishop here is sort of in the way. But the other rook, if the bishop moves, could come to b8. So black species are in the attack, but Vichy Anand managed to stay really calm and used his chances perfectly. Queen takes c2, was played. Uh, bishop takes c3, bishop takes c3, rook takes c3, queen takes c3 check, queen takes c3, rook takes c3, ef7, rook f8, g6, black resigned. Uh, and obviously he is down material and just much worse. So... Let's go back to the position after white castle. So bishop e7, Vichy Anand started an attack of his own, and black played correctly. He saw that he was worse, so he counterattacked. But uh, even more important at that point is how Vichy Anand reacted to the counterattack. He remained calm, he didn't uh, blunder anything, he played king b1, which was the best move, he didn't take the knight here immediately, which was the best move, he continued with his own threats, he remained calm throughout the attack, and black simply couldn't do anything. Even though this seems scary, I mean, you are threatening checkmate here on a2, Vichy Anand played uh, just the right defensive moves, just enough defensive moves, three all together, and all the other time, all the other tempi he used to counterattack. Uh, okay, uh, I hope you got something from these three games. Once again, uh, I wanted to show three different teams in active defense. So one of them is counterattack if possible, do not defend if you can counterattack. If your opponent is attacking on the flank, counterattack in the center, and vice versa. If you are defending and there is no possibility for a good counterattack, then bring all of your defenders into play and try to defend as active as possible. And the third one is 
don't be scared of your opponent's attack and try to assess it objectively. Do not overestimate it. Do not underestimate it. If you don't have to defend, don't defend. In my last game, and you can see it on the channel, I was I played it this Sunday. I played the move queen f8 uh, instead of h5. I played the passive defensive moves move instead of uh, an active attacking move, which could have won me the game. Okay, uh, thank you very much for watching. Please let me know what you think about the video. Once again, thanks very much for the support and everything and stay tuned for more chess. See you later. Bye-bye.